Good morning. We'd like to welcome you to our worship service today and hope that you will join in singing with us. So then you're no longer strangers and foreigners, but you're fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord. Oh 
You hear me when I call. You are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, I cannot hide the light. And whom shall I fear? You crush the enemy underneath thy feet. You are my sword and shield. Though troubles linger still, whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angels always by my side. My strength is in your name, for you alone can save. You will deliver me, yours is a victory. And whom shall I Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to be together again today, and we just thank you that you stand by our side through it all. And uh, just now as we think about those on our prayer list, Father, we just um, ask you uh, to suit a blessing to each of their needs, Father, and be with those in our community and our church family who've lost loved ones recently, and uh, just be with those in the hospital um, facing complications from surgeries and uh, just ask your healing hand upon them and uh, be with our men and women in the armed forces. Uh, try to uh, bring them back home safely to their families, Father. Uh, we just thank you so much each and every day for all the things you do for us. And it's through your son, Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. 
twilight pines take my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I Psalm 62 says, Truly my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from Him. Truly He is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be shaken. Yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from Him. Truly He is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. My soul finds rest in God alone, my rock and my salvation, a fortress strong against my foes, and I will not be shaken. Though lips may bless and hearts may curse, and lies like arrows pierce me, I'll fix my heart on righteousness. I'll look to him who hears me. Oh, praise him, hallelujah, my delight in my reward. Ever my soul in God alone amid the world's temptations when evil seeks to take a hold I'll cling to my salvation though riches come and riches go don't set your heart upon them the fields of hope in which I sow are harvested in Breathe 
a lot of the people that are around you. But thank God there are people around you that you can trust. I will say the last uh, week, and week or so has been pretty rough for me. This is uh, a week and a half ago I lost my dad. And, and I have to say that was very hard. Dad was 89 years old. But let me tell you, there is nothing more real in this world than the love of a father. My dad was full of love. And I know that. I know everything that my dad has done for me through the years as I was growing up, things that we did together, things that he did for me, no matter what it is, I just, I know by looking into my dad's eyes, the love that he had for me. I can feel that in my heart. And there's nothing more precious than the love of a father. And having said that, what about the love of our Father in heaven? God loves us so much. John 3.16, we know so well that he gave his one and only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And uh, some other scriptures I'd like to share this morning as well. Out of John again, chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. 1 John 3.16 says, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. No greater love is there than that. 1 John 3.18 says, Dear children, dear children, let us not love with words or tongue, but with actions and in truth. And speaking of my dad again, that's how I know that he loved me, because of the actions that he did towards me and the truth that he told me. The love of my father was real, my earthly father. And I know in my heart, because I believe with all my heart, that the love of God is real. Uh, if there are those out there hearing me and hearing this just now, and you need uh, somehow, some way to find out more about the love of God, contact us, contact me, contact the church, and speak to our ministers or someone here, and we'll be more than glad to share with you about the love of God. But having said that, as we come around this table to partake of these emblems, may we never forget the great love that God bestowed upon each and every one of us because he sent his one and only son and he hung on the cross and spread his arms and that's how much God loves us that he sent his son to die for us. And as we partake of this loaf that resembles the broken body and we drink this cup that resembles the blood that was shed for our sins, May we never forget that great and powerful and wonderful love that God has given us through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Let us pray. Father God, this morning, as we come around this table, Lord, may we never forget the great and wonderful gift you've given us through our Lord and Savior, your Son, Jesus. You willingly sent him here on our behalf because, God, you knew that we are weak, we are sinners, and we couldn't do nothing on our own, God, but you had to help us. And we just thank you so much this morning for the help that you've given us through Jesus. And I do pray, God, if there are someone out there or some people out there who uh, hasn't accepted you as Lord and Savior, I pray that they would find the courage and the wherewithal to do that. And the next time we come around this table, they could share this great feast. Father, again, just thank you so much for the love that you've bestowed upon us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
We're glad that you're joining us again here at Grassy Creek Christian Church. I want to just share a story with you as we start out this morning. There was this soldier that was in battle. And as he was going forth in battle, all of a sudden he saw the enemy coming at him. And there was just one soldier coming at him. But he looked up at him and he took his rifle and he tried to fire it. But it misfired. And he tried again. But nothing. He misfired. He tried a third time. It misfired. So finally, having nothing else to do, he just pointed his finger at the guy and went bangity bang. And you know what happened? The soldier fell over dead. The other guy fell over dead. He looked at his finger and said, it worked, it worked. And sure enough, there's another one coming and he went bangity bang and the guy fell over dead. And there's another one and bangity bang and he fell over dead. And then there was a whole group coming at him and he thought, well, that's not gonna work. So he thought, okay, well, let's try this. And he took it, he made like he had a bazooka and he went boomity boom, boomity boom. And all of a sudden, all of them dropped over dead. Well, he was getting through this right quite well. I mean, after all, everybody was dropping dead in front of him because of his bangity bangs and his boomity booms. And then so he was going on, but then there's this little guy and the enemy soldier coming at him, a very, very little guy. And he just kept coming and kept coming and kept coming. So he took his, his finger and he went bangity bang, nothing happened. Bangity bang, nothing happened. So he thought boomity boom, nothing happened. Boomity boom, nothing happened. And all of a sudden he went to the ground and as he was dying, he remembered hearing the other guy going tankity tank, tankity tank, tankity tank. You know when you're in a battle, it's important to know who you're up against. And so God wants us to know that when we're in this battle, it's a spiritual battle. And when we're in this battle because of who we are and because of who he is and that we serve him, when we're in this battle, then the result's gonna be that Satan, the most powerful other than God, the most powerful in the universe is gonna be against us. And so we can't fight with our own weapons. We need weapons that God will provide for us. And so we've talked about some of those weapons. We talked about the belt of truth. We, we've, uh, we've talked about, um, all, about uh, all the other things that we've said here. But one of the things that we need to look at today is a shield of faith. The shield of faith. And so I'd ask you to join me in Ephesians chapter 6 and beginning with verse 10. It says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle... It's not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm, then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, a breastplate of righteousness in place, your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Let's pray. Father, thank you that we're not on our own. Thank you that we have you to provide the weapons that we need to go against this incredible en enemy, this powerful enemy. Thank you that you are more than he can ever be. And thank you that you're on our side. Because when God is for us, who can be against us? Let us learn from that today. Let it strengthen our shield of faith. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. So here we are, and you think about the Roman shield. And I want you to picture this, because the Roman shield is very important. I mean, it was made and it was designed, it was engineered in, in, in an amazing way. It was about four foot long and about two and a half feet wide. And they would take two pieces of wood and put them together back to back. And then they would take over top of the wood and they would put leather across that wood. And the sides would be have metal all around, those, uh, all around the sides. And so it was very important, not just how they were made though, but what they did with them. When they were going out to fight in a, a battle the next day, the night before what they would do is take those shields, that leather of the shields, and they would soak it in water. They would soak it in water. Now you might find that kind of strange, but here's the thing. When they would go into battle, one of the first things that people would launch against them were an attack of arrows. And oftentimes, not just regular arrows, but fiery arrows because they would come and whether if they would hit the body, the shield would protect them from hitting the body, but also it would cause them to glance off. And when they would glance off though, because the area was so dry and it was so arid in these areas where they fought oftentimes, 
they would cause it to catch on fire. And of course then, the guys would be concerned about the fire and they would be working on putting out fires rather than fighting or protecting themselves. And so they would be able to take those shields that had been soaked all night long and they could put them down against the arrow and they would be able to extinguish the arrows. That's what they would do with their shield. Now I find that very important and that leads us to the first point. What you need to do with your shield of faith is you need to soak your shield of faith. But you don't just soak it in anything. Soak your shield of faith in the word of God and in his promises. Soak your shield of faith in the word of God and in his promises. In Psalm chapter 119 and beginning with verse 9, the psalmist writes, How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. Praise be to you, O Lord. Teach me your decrees. With my lips I recount all the laws that come from your mouth. I rejoice in following your statutes as one rejoices in great riches. I meditate upon your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. One of the things I think it's interesting here is he says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By following your word. You see, he, he's not just talking about getting some kind of knowledge. He's not just talking about faith being knowledge that comes to you, but he's talking about faith being something that is active, that you are acting upon. Look at it this way. Let's say you had a bad headache. And so you would reach over and you would go to your medicine cabinet or wherever it might be, and you would reach out and you would get maybe Tylenol or something like that. And you would take the Tylenol. Why? Because you have faith that in taking that Tylenol, the headache is going to go away. You have faith that in doing so. But if all they did was let that Tylenol sit in there and you knew that it could take care of your headache, then your headache's not going to go away. It's when you act upon that that it goes away. I'm sitting in my chair at home and on my easy chair at night, and I got my feet up, and I'm really comfortable, and I'm working my puzzles. But then it starts getting darker and darker and darker in the room, and soon I realize I need to turn on a light. And so I hit the button to lower my easy chair, you know, and I get up, and I walk over, and I extend the energy to walk over and to turn on the light switch. Why? Because I have faith that turning on the light switch is gonna illuminate the room, that it's gonna help put light in the room. I wouldn't get up, I wouldn't extend the energy if I didn't think that it was actually going to work. That's faith being walked out. That's faith being walked out. Think about it with Jesus. Here's Jesus and he's in the wilderness. He's been there for 40 years. I mean, 40, 40 years, 40 days. He's been in the wilderness for 40 days and now he is hungry, the Bible says. But Satan comes to him and he starts attacking him with temptations. Now, I happen to believe personally that he probably has been attacking him all along. But also, I happen to believe that there are many, many more temptations that he gives to him than what we have here. We just have these three that are listed. But what do all these three have in common? It's about a desire, a natural desire that Jesus would have. It's about a passion of Jesus, if you will, at this time as well. And so here he is, and so what Satan does is he exploits these desires that Jesus would have. And listen to what it says in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 3, the first temptation. The tempter came to him and said, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Now let me ask you, was it wrong for Jesus to be hungry? Not at all. He'd been there for 40 days and hadn't eaten anything. I mean, we can't go 40 minutes without a Snickers sometimes, right? And so here he is. He's been there for 40 days, hasn't eaten anything. So it's not wrong for him to be hungry. He's going to be hungry because he is in the flesh. He has been incarnated. And because he's been incarnated, he has a digestive system like us. He has hunger like us. And he is experiencing it right then and there. So it's not wrong for him to be hungry. It may not even be wrong for him to eat. But what is the problem here? It's the way that Satan is saying this. You see, it's not God's plan. It's not God's way for Jesus to use his powers to take care of himself. It's only his plan, evidently, for him to use them to take care of others. And so here he is. He has an opportunity. He could have fed himself at any time. But instead, he's waiting. Why? Because there's something about this fasting that he needs to do. So Jesus has a choice. Do I follow the way that Satan's offering? Or do I follow God's way for me. And so we know what he did. He followed God's way. He soaked his shield in 
the uh, word of God and the promises of God, knowing that God would take care of him. And so he tells Satan that no, it is written, so there's God's word, that man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. He's trusting in God's word. And then so what else happens then? In verse 11, we read that the angels come and attend him. In other words, he is rewarded for what he did for waiting. God takes care of him in God's way. And that's what we see there. But then look at the next uh, temptation in verse 5. Then the devil took him to a holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you're a son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Why is he tempting him this way? What t- what's his desire? Well, Jesus had a desire for men to come to him. He wanted to draw men to him. That's what he came here for, that he could seek and to save the lost. And what a great way, Satan says, for you to draw men to you as you get up on top of his temple and to jump off. Right? And Jesus says, no. No. Because God has told me there's another way that I will draw men to me. And in John chapter 12 and verse 32, we read about that way. It says, but I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. Again, there's a choice. Choose Satan's way, get up on the temple, jump off, or choose God's way, the cross. Jesus chose the cross. And you and I, I am very thankful, and you should be very thankful that he did as well. But then there's a third temptation, back in verse 8. It says, again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. You see, what was his desire here? To draw the nations to him. To, control, to, to have the nations be, uh, be ruled by Jesus. And for him to be able to, to uh, make sure that everybody's doing God's will. Man, what a great gift this would have been. What a great thing. I mean, let's make Jesus king, right? Let's make Jesus president. Let's have Jesus, let's have Jesus make everybody do the right thing in every situation. And that's what we're looking at here. But instead, Jesus has a choice to make. Do I do it this way? No, I go again to the cross. I go again to the cross. And God rewarded him for it. In Philippians chapter 2 and verse 9 says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, then gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Notice in all three temptations, Satan offered a way for Jesus to react, a way for Jesus to follow. But in all three temptations, there was God's way as well. And Jesus chose God's way, God's way. How's this play on us? Think about it. Let's say a person has hurt you. They've backstabbed you. They've criticized you unjustly. They've talked you down. They've hurt somebody that you love. Whatever it might be, they slandered you. Well, you have a choice. You can react in a way that the world reacts. You can react in a way that you probably want to react. Or you can follow God's word. And what does God's word say about that? In Matthew chapter 18, it says, If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault. Just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you've won your brother over. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them... Tell it to the church. If he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Jesus tells us in other parts that we are to love our enemy. We're to pray for our enemy. You see, that's the way that God wants us to handle those things. And so the result is we don't get bitter. We don't get resentful. We're not unforgiving. So we can choose. We can be resentful. We can be bitter. We can be unforgiving. We can even strike back. Or we follow Jesus. We need to soak our shields in the word and the promises of God. Dunk your shield often in God's word. Now let's go back to the shield. Because there's something else about this shield that I want you to understand. And that's the way that it was, not just the way it was made, but the shape of it. The shape of it was a dome shape. It wasn't straight across. It was a dome shape. And so this enabled them that when they got into battle, not just to protect themselves, 
but to protect each other. They would do that by getting underneath and they would have in the front, they would have two or three lined up and then rows of three and four all the way back. And what they would do is the ones in the front would put their shields in the front and get behind them or get below them. And then the ones in the back uh, would also put them up on top and they would hold them on top. And the ones in the back would put theirs down in back of them. And so they were able to protect themselves from anything that would come because it would be like a clamshell design. In fact, if you were looking at it from above, they called this the tortoise shell. The tortoise shell formation. And so that's what it looked like. But not only would it protect them, but they were also able to move and to go through uh, embattlements because of this shape of their shield and overlapping it with each other. It was important for them to overlap it with each other. Overlap your shield with the shields of others. That's what we need to do with our shield of faith. That's the second thing. Overlap your shield with the shields of faith of others. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of times when we hear testimonies and we think, wow, that was a great testimony. Man, that's a fantastic testimony. And we take encouragement by that. Or we hear somebody and, you know, maybe they will tell about, um, they will give you support or they'll encourage you. And this is so very important. The people that we Christians come together to do this. And it's when we actually get with them. One of the things that's happened in the pandemic is it's taught people to get along isolated. They can isolate themselves in their home and they can have groceries delivered and they can have everything you can imagine delivered, their food delivered, even carryouts delivered and so forth. Whatever it might be, they have all these things and all these ways of getting those things. And so it's taught us isolation, maybe even fear other people that we don't want to be around them any longer. But let me tell you something that I've experienced and I know many of you have because I've heard it over and over. And that is we're missing the fellowship of the church. For those of you that are listening online, especially if you're a distance away, that's, that's great. We're glad that you're doing it. But let me encourage you, find a local church, if you're not already in one, that teaches God's word. And find that church and get into the fellowship of that church. Oh, you can continue to listen to us if you want, but make sure that you have other Christians around you. Here at Grassy Creek, we're going to be opening up some things. I mean, we're going to talk in, in June the 12th. We're going to have, on that, that evening, we're going to have a, a celebration where we're going to have games and all kinds of things. We're just coming together to have game night. And so we're going to have some outdoor games and all those things going on. We're going to have some uh, food that will be here for everybody to share in. And we're just going to have a good time. We talked also about having a pool party uh, that we're going to have in July. And then some other things that are going to be happening. We're opening up. We're talking about getting our Sunday school classes back to where they really were before the pandemic. And all these things. And even just coming together today, I think we feel each other. We, we find this fellowship better and better and better. I can tell you one thing that happened. When we started getting back into church, people weren't rushing out these doors. I mean, afterwards you could see pockets here and pockets there and pockets there of people communicating and talking and sharing with each other. Out in the foyer, the same thing. Out in the parking lot, the same thing. Why? Because we know we need each other. But there are some people who feel like they don't need anyone else. They don't need to be held accountable. They don't need encouragement. They don't need someone to share victory with. They don't need someone to cry with or to laugh with, or to grow with. But there's that old song that keeps coming back to my mind. No man is an island. You know, even Jesus didn't go it alone. He didn't. Think about it. He had multitudes following him on one occasion. But then what did he do with the multitudes? He went through that multitude and he selected 12. 12 men whom he could pour his life into. 12 men that he would live with, he would eat with, he would sleep in the same place where they were. You know, he would, they were, their lives would just be poured into each other. Twelve men he could mentor in that way and prepare for ministry when he was gone. Twelve men. But out of that twelve, there were three that became very, very close to him. Peter, James, and John. They became closer than any of the others. And so out of the twelve, he even found three more intimate relationships. And then he had other relationships as well. We read about him going to the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus and how he enjoyed going there in order to have meals and so forth, how they would take care of him and his needs. And so he had all that relationship as well. As a matter of fact, you know, another thing that was going on, as you think about it, 
We came to a point where Jesus is going to the Garden of Gethsemane. And you know what he said to his men? You stay here and keep watch while I go over there and pray. But you keep watch. I need you here with me now. Jesus didn't do life on his own, and we shouldn't either. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 to 25, we read, Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in a habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Overlap your shield of faith with each other. And thirdly, reinforce your shield. There are times when those shields need to be reinforced. They get worn, they get torn, they get uh, damaged, and they need to be reinforced. And we need to do the same thing. That means we need a fresh step of faith. So reinforce your shield by taking steps of faith today, today. Let me explain this by using another Old Testament example. And that goes back to the children of Israel. Here they were, they were getting ready to cross over into the promised land. And what did God do? You know, for 10 and a half months, the Jordan River was about, three, or was about uh, 10 to 12 yards wide. That was it, shallow. And when we were over there in Israel, that's the way it was. It looked like a creek, but that's 10 and a half months of a year. Of the other month and a half, it's in flood stage. You want to guess when God brought the children of Israel over to the other side of the Jordan River so that they would have to cross? It was when it was in flood stage. It could be as much as a mile wide of a rushing river in flood stage. And why would God do that? Well, the people had already crossed through the Red Sea. But you know the majority, or all those people that had crossed through the Red Sea, but all the adults, except for Caleb and Joshua, had died in the wilderness. These were ones who saw it either as youth or as ones that were born while they were in the wilderness so they'd never saw this before. So what's God doing? He's providing their step of faith because they're going to have to step into the water. They're going to have to watch the water divide. They're going to have to step over on the other side. He is giving them a fresh step of faith that they can take too. And that's what he does with them. You see, he gave them something new to hang on to. Let me tell you, it's important for you to come to church and to hear other people tell about God's word and teach you God's word. You can be, you can be inspired by that. It's important to hear testimonies of other people and to just feel encouraged because of them. You can be encouraged because of that. But there's nothing like experiencing God's word for yourself. There's nothing like diving deep into it yourself. There's nothing like putting yourself there where you are being tested and where God is taking care of a situation in your life where you know that you've had a hard time, a hard situation. You've prayed, you've turned it over to God, and he's responded, and your faith grows as a result. But in order to experience that, you've got to get into the water. It's in Matthew chapter 14 that we read that Jesus, after a long day, after the feeding of the 5,000, decided he was going to go up to the mountain to pray by himself. So he sent his disciples on across the sea. And as they went on across the sea, you remember what happened. The waves started getting up and the wind started beating and they were fighting against that, all, all the, the elements when all of a sudden they saw something come walking to them on the water. And some of them said, it's a ghost, it's a ghost. And they were terrified, the Bible says. But then Jesus says, no, it isn't a ghost. It's me, it's me. And then listen to what Peter says in verse 28 of Matthew chapter 14. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said, and Peter got out of a boat, walked on the water, and came to Jesus. When he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith. Why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Don't look at the doubt of Peter. Look at the fact that he got out of the boat in the first place. Eleven other disciples stayed in that boat. Peter got out. And that's what we need to do, is get out of our boats, to get our feet wet to get into God's word ourselves, to get into understanding and praying and asking God to help us through situations and receiving the victories through those things ourselves. I close by sharing a story with you that comes out of Nashville, Tennessee. It's about a preacher's family. It says one of the preacher's sons was the name of John Shoulders. He's a Christian leader in education in Nashville today. In 1968, John was a young boy on January the 30th, 1968, John's father, whom he loved with all his heart, was on his way home after preaching an evening service. 
and he was killed in a car accident. He was killed, actually, by a drunk driver. John and his siblings were raised by their young widow of a mother from that point on. And the children wrestled at times with a profound sense of not just loss, but also bitterness and frustration. But their mother wouldn't let them wallow in it. She repeatedly called upon them to have faith in God and that he would provide for them and that they would see their dad again someday. But in the meantime, she told them, if we're going to move forward as a family, we have to learn to forgive that man that did this reckless thing. And we will do it by beginning to pray for him. So together, the family learned how to fight off these flaming arrows of bitterness and resentment that were being launched toward them. The man was put in prison. His name was Chuck Ely, but he was only in prison for two years. It was in 1998, 30 years after the tragedy, that John had a friend call him. John's friend had been in an AA meeting in Nashville, Tennessee, and he told John that that night he'd heard another man there share a story about his life. The man had told the group about a terrible tragedy that he was involved in in January 1968. He went on to confess that he was drunk and at the wheel and that he caused the accident and took the life of a young preacher in Nashville. And he left a young widow to raise her children. The man went on to say, I came to faith in prison and I've discovered AA and haven't touched a drop since. But he went on to say that the group, to that group that if there was anything I could do and I could wish for before I die, it would be to find that family and express sorrow, my sorrow to their faces for what I caused and ask for their forgiveness. He knew who the family was, but he didn't know how to get in touch with them. And he also didn't know if he should do it because he didn't know how they would respond. John's friend, when he had heard about this, he contacted John and told him about it. And John said, I'd like to meet Chuck for myself. So a meeting was arranged and John was taken to meet Chuck Ely the man who was drunk at the wheel when he took his father's life 30 years earlier. Together, they wept in each other's arms. And later, John arranged for Chuck to meet his mother. And when she met him, she extended loving arms of forgiveness and took Chuck's face in her hands and said, Chuck, I want you to know I heard you gave your life to Christ in prison. And my precious husband who would have gladly given his life for you to come to Jesus. You are forgiven. Together, Chuck and that elderly woman held each other together and wept profusely. Chuck became close with John and his entire family. It was John that gave Chuck his 35th anniversary sobriety medal in AA. And when Chuck died a couple of years ago, it was Chuck's family that asked John to do the funeral of the man who had taken his father's life. John himself is a Christian leader in Nashville. He has been for several decades now. He didn't lose any of his life to resentment or bitterness because he had a mama telling him, have faith in God, have faith in God. And it was with that shield of faith that John and his family were able to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. What about you? Because you see, you need to take up that shield of faith as well. Satan will fire those flaming arrows at you. He'll fire them at your family. He'll fire them at your finances. He'll fire them at the relationships that you have. He'll fire them at anything that he can possibly get to try and get you off shelter, off kelter. He'll try and try to confuse you, to frustrate you, and to get you fighting battles that you don't need to be fighting, but instead that you need to be fighting him. He'll get arrows of resentment. He'll fire flaming arrows of bitterness into your life. But instead, soak your shield in the word of God, so that you can take it and you can extinguish those flaming arrows of the evil one. Now for some of you, the flaming arrows are coming because Satan wants you to keep putting off accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior. So he's fired some flaming arrows at you as well. He fired the flaming arrow that says, you've got more time, you've got plenty of time, live your life the way you want to now, you've got more time, you can do this later. Or he's firing that flaming arrow that, hey, you know, everybody's going to heaven. It really doesn't matter. Or he's firing that flaming arrow that says, that, you know, um, when you think about this, you don't need to repent. After all, you're no worse than anybody else in this group or, or even in your community. You're no worse. In fact, you're better than some of them. You don't need to repent. But instead, you need to take up the word of God. You need to soak your shield of faith in the word of God. And you need to have that fresh step toward Jesus so that he can forgive your sins and that he can give you the gift of the Holy Spirit. He'll do that. 
if you'll just respond and do what the Bible says to do. We would love to talk to you about that. At the end of this message, you'll see um, ways of contacting us. I also wanted to let you know that in the coming days, uh, next week, we actually will not be doing a video on YouTube. It'll be on Facebook only because we're going to do Facebook Live. And on Facebook Live, you'll be able to get hold of that that morning at, uh, when we go into our service at 1030. But it's, a, it's our youth service. The youth have control, a complete control of the service, if you will. And they're going to be uh, leading songs. And they're going to be, um, one of our youth is going to be preaching. And I think you'd really look forward. You, can, you really will be pleased if you tune in to us that way. But again, remember, we're going to try Facebook Live and give it a shot and see if we can do it that way rather than the taping beforehand. If you have any questions, again, reach out to us. You'll see the information following this video. Let's bow. Father, what a great God you are. Thank you for giving us that shield of faith with which we can extinguish those flaming arrows because we know Satan will fire them and they will distract us unless we have soaked that shield in the word of God and your promises, unless we have overlapped them with other Christians. Father, help us to do exactly that. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you and have a blessed day.